guys in the room. How you doing? Who better than Derek, Pat, Andrew, the wrestling crew Man, they bout to put an end to y'all careers like a finishing move They bout to give y'all facts on these cats that's fighting on these mats Y'all can't see them like John Cena Even if y'all had 2020 vision, y'all better listen Pay attention and take notes down and realize that it's not your time now And watch these three kings take the crown, Hey. This is Sean Maluta, the king of the Savat Kick, and you're listening to Wrestling IQ 101. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of Wrestling IQ 101. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Wrestling IQ 101. And today, I'm sitting here with Derek. You. And our special guest is the odd soul of Vinny Chenzo, man. How's it going? It's going good, man. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, definitely. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here. Of course. Yeah, definitely. So, then, you know, let's talk about the beginning. You know, how did you become a wrestling fan to start with? Um, this is, I, I love this story. It's my favorite. So, um, like anybody, you know, I would I would say around the age, maybe five, six, I would, you know, Saturday morning. That's mm-hmm. when a lot of us had the chance to watch it. So, early, early captivated, you know, those larger than life guys, your Hulk Hogan's, your Warriors and stuff like that. Um, and then I want to say closer to eight years old, uh, my dad took me to the spectrum and that was my it moment for me. It was, I want to say Brett and Slaughter in the main. And that was just like, eyes were wide. It was, was, it was just, I said to myself from that point on, and I know that's crazy for being eight, but I was like, I want to do this. This is, this is something I love. There's no way around this. Nice. That was going to be one of my questions later on. Like, what defined? Like, what was your it moment? That's your it moment. That's oh, a, yeah. a good moment to have too. Yeah, Brett and Slaughter, man. It was just it was larger than life for me that match. Yeah, it's, Ooh. Kind, of, it's kind of funny because mine kind of blends it with Brett too. But it's also going to Madison Square Garden uh, the day the click, you know, the, the curtain call. Curtain call. That's my first wrestling show. Mm-hmm. And like Houseboy with TV, like front row seats. <laughs> oh, right on. <laughs> you know, uh, pretty close to the ring with my dad, and then. I'll never forget this. Uh, Bret Hart is 96. It's a big snowstorm, and Diesel is supposed to be there uh, at the autograph signing. And my grandma comes in. She's like, oh, yeah, Weasel won't be there, but Bert, Bert Hart is going to be there. And we're like, who the hell's Bert and who's Weasel? So we get online, and um, you literally, you know, I see Bret Hart. I'm like, I'm, I'm like all the way at the end, you know, at the line. It's like snowing on top of us. It's a blizzard. And we get out to the to the platform and my grandpa shows the security guard his badge because he was a New York City police officer and he's like yeah you can you can touch Brett you can touch the title and nobody else could do that it was just autograph and go and it was funny like my mom has pictures of me with Brett and I'm like a little like chihuahua like on his arms you know oh, like, nice. like on the end of the... yeah so it was kind of funny like you and Brett and uh, oh yeah Brett, Brett was huge yeah, for so me when that. I was little um, my, uh, my kid, we, I guess, cause we, you know, we all have that one kid picture. Mine was with Taker. Oh, yeah. I, I don't even remember how we got it, but it was just nice. like, you know, and obviously I'm short. So <laughs> back there and back then, I was, holy shit. Guys, oh, I'm sorry. Are, are you guys? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So who, during that time, who was your favorite growing up? Was Brett one of your favorites or Virgin. you actually had him? <laughs> uh, yeah, Brett was, Brett was up there. Um, Flair, Flair for me was huge too. Um, I, and I don't know if it was, I mean, I did, I liked a lot of the guys with the technical ability. I liked being wowed, you know, by in-ring performance too. But, you know, you know, I guess just it's, it's age-wise, it, the staples on me were guys like Brett, guys who were more charismatic. Yeah. And Flair was one of those guys too. Mr. Perfect too, as he's really started to come to his own back then. So when did you get actually started in the business? Started in the business. Yeah. Well, like most, I, I, I did my uh, backyard days. Um, I want to say in, we were like in sixth, seventh grade when CZW really started to come out in Mantua. Yeah. And, you know, that was 
because I didn't really go to a lot of indies. I mean, you know, Dapper and the Coraluzos had their shows around us, and you know, you'd see guys, and I maybe went to one or two shows, and it, and it was cool, but it was you know nothing like you saw on TV at that point. Fast forward, and then I those those CZW Mantua days and Jersey All Pro, then my eyes were just like completely open to like that. There's there's so much more than what you get on TV on a regular basis. So we started doing backyard. And I want to say by the time we were sophomores in high school, and I'm not going to mention the, <clears throat> the name of the place because I just don't want to do them a disservice, but we were just, you know, we saw guys like Nick Mondo and Rick Blade and your super, you know, and uh, who else? Fujita, the pack seats, you know, and we're 16, 17 year old kids. We're skinny as a rail, you know, semi-athletic at that point, And we're just trying to m- mirror everything they did. So this one place saw that, you know, we were pushing heavy backyard tapes. So they said that they would train us. They did. They taught us our fundamentals, but they didn't really give us a platform. So, I mean, I would say that that was my start, but it ultimately didn't pan out. I would say my my, my legit start was to late 2009 at the Monster Factory. Nice. Yeah. yeah some great talent has gone through there, too. Yeah, when, when Danny pretty much reopened it. <clears throat> so talk about Five Guys and how that got started. Five Guys. Um, well, it technically got started, uh, before me. So the, the, the running joke is, is, was that it was, it was Banksy, Bravo, Dan, and, uh, Scotty Priest at the time. And, um, they were, it was an eight man and I don't even remember who was on the other team, but Scotty wasn't paying attention. <laughs> they weren't calling anything. So they said, we're going to, we're going to turn on, like, just not even pay attention. Like, we're going to turn on you. We're going to create this five guys thing. And he's sitting on this one. He's like, Oh, okay. So <laughs> ultimately it started with three guys, okay. but with Jim and, um, uh, what's well with Jim and moose. Um, it was, it, it was still five. So that was the incarnation. And it was just as, just this running joke because <laughs> Scotty was supposed to be the fifth guy and he wasn't even paying attention. And then, um, fast forward to, uh, we were in, yeah, Manasquan. And me and Jeff Noyes had a singles match. And that's when I uh, compressed my T7 and T8. And we've all known each other for years. Uh, Banksy, Dan, uh, me and Bravo, a little bit newer. What's funny is because me and Bravo live right in the same town, five minutes away from each other. (laughs) And we didn't even know it for, you know, a few years. And uh, I'll definitely, Banksy was was the one. Because, you know, like I had never really injured anything before. And um, Banksy was like, man, don't let it get you down, you know. Keep your head up, and we, we will absolutely have a spot for you when you get back. So lo and behold, I, I uh, took that summer off. I was in Ortho and Cairo every week, and we came back, and we just we manned up and did five guys. We started it all and made it legit. Yeah, because you guys just ran over the SWF. You, know, you took over. You even had your own show. Yeah, we had a, it's, you know, not that it was the greatest or the biggest show, but like you said, though, it was our own show and it was neat to have that because you don't really see too many stables, you know, yeah. having their own shows nowadays. Yeah. And what was cool was that was WrestleMania weekend and we still drew. Yeah, pretty incredible too. Yeah. Can you, so, <clears throat> I don't think I've ever asked this question before, but what do, what do you think is the hardest part about being a wrestler? Hardest part? Yeah. Um... You know, I mean, there's a lot of things you can go to. You know, a lot of guys, you know, if people have nagging injuries. A lot of people can say that. It's, you know, it's the mental, you know, of that, of going through stuff and, you know, trying to stay loose and stretching and stuff like that. And, I mean, and that depends, too, on how often you're working. You know, you got a lot of guys. If you look at a guy like Joey Janela, man, he's he's four or five times a week. It's no, no different to that WWE schedule. Mm-hmm. But on the indies, going further places, wrestling different people. But, you know, I, I would say personally for me, you know, and, and where my involvement is at and my level where I am right now in, you know, doing some more, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff with SWF as well. Uh, it, it's, it's just that mental, you know, it's staying focused. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's the hardest part is, you know, and being in this many years later, it's just, you know, staying focused and staying refreshed and being happy with what you're putting out. So, you know, talk about your relationship with Rob Fury, <laughs> you know, if, if there is one. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, 
Um, just some promoters, just you know, you, you work for them and that's it. You know, at the end of the day, like, if you have. Yeah, well, Rob's a different story. Um, I make no bones about it. You know, uh, Rob obviously is a guy who, you know, there's people that love him and there's people that want to see him fail miserably. You know, you've seen these BWEs and you've seen a lot of people. We've had a lot of, you know, other places that we've brothered up with that have come through and it's not worked out for us. But um, I will always give Rob, at the end of the day, I've he's, he slayed a lot of dragons. SWF is a place that's still standing. And Rob, for me personally, he's like family. Um, I can say, you know, on that line personally, that he's never done wrong by me. He's given me a lot of opportunities. I've in Rob's rings, I faced a lot of guys. There are a lot of people who give a limb. You know, Haku, one of them. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm trying to name drop, but you know, there's there's times where it's like, you know, you, hey, we're we're going with this, and I'm like, do I deserve that? Am I ready for that? You know, and for him to have that faith in me. You know, that pushes me, like I said, and stay focused. Is my stuff refreshed? Am I ready to go out there, you know, and do what I have to do? Nice. Well, I'm actually the name drop now. And I'm actually, <laughs> who, who was your favorite opponent that you faced so far? Oh, of all time? Yeah. I'd have to easily hands down Kevin Nash. Kevin Nash. Nice. Nice. Kevin Nash, yeah. Getting Jackknife and the uh, Brick Alex, man, there was, that was one of the craziest things ever. Nice. That's yeah, awesome. that was fun. Yeah, that was and it's what's cool for me personally too is my little brother was it? My brother had trained at the factory too, so it was my uh, my little brother and Kevin Nash versus me and Jeff Noise when we were a uh, riot. Oh, nice. That's oh, awesome. Yeah, that was good. That's yeah, it was standing room only that night too, man. That crowd was enthusiastic. They, it was just, it was it was a pretty cool experience. So you recently just won the hardcore championship against Matt Raymond. How was it getting in the ring with him? Because we talked about that before, I mean, you know, this guy's a stable of independent wrestling, you know, and you, this is the first time, you said it was overdue, you know, in your opinion. Oh, yeah, I absolutely feel like it was overdue. So, you know, just the, you know, I don't know how much you guys break the fourth wall here, but, you know, there's there's a lot of guys who, you know, in, in wrestling, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before, you know, you have your acquaintances and you have people that are, you, you can find actually family in this business. Mm-hmm. And guys like Tremont and guys like Cannonball are like family to me. Um... People will say till they're blue in the face. Guys like Matt and Low Life Louie are just the most genuinely nice dudes, and that's real life. Like that's that really is them. And uh, I've always, you know, on top of that, the the cool thing for me and Matt is, um, you know, going back to all those CZW shows we used to go to, from Mantua to Sewell to you know when they started doing the stuff in Delaware and all their heavy deathmatch stuff. You know, we sat in the same crowd at the same time and, you know, we, you know, high and by didn't really know each other. But what's cool is, you know, that being close in that age range and, you know, moving forward, then Matt going on to becoming the bulldozer, you know, and the god of ultraviolet wrestling. Yeah. Um, always has been stand up by me. I've, I've done on point shows for him. Uh, I just, you know, it's not to sound marky, but he's a guy like. He's, he's not just limited to that deathmatch stuff either. That guy can go. Um, I know Matt since his New Moon Rising days when we uh, started the factory and we were kind of like brother-sister promotion. And um, just just watch. I mean, he's evolved so much. And for me personally, like, that, that that's just one of the dudes that I absolutely had to be in there with. Like, there was making no bones about it. Now, kind of going like a... Um like a like an opposite route. Uh, you do some work for Grimm's Toy Show as well. Yeah. Um, so can you kind of tell us about like your experiences there and uh, how it is working there, as opposed to you know wrestling for like your normal independent wrestling company? Oh yeah, it's it's definitely a different atmosphere. Like you know, in the fact that and. I'm not trying to take anything away from the guy, but you know, if if you do watch a toy show, you can you know you can there, there are wrestling guests on there, but you can see that you know for a while some of the guys weren't necessarily trained pro wrestlers, and you know then that's that's being fair. And when Grimm started getting on more indie shows, you know it's some people had a conflict of interest with it. I'm sure you guys saw the thing a few months back with Kirk and Bradley and all that stuff that went down. You know, but this is my thing is at the end of the day, I know that Graham went to school and he got trained. I know he's a good dude and it does involve wrestling and it's entertaining people. So I'm, I'm very, I try to be ever the optimist. So I just try to look at it from that point of view that like, you know what, 
no matter how ha ha you know it is, or you know, at least at some point he's trying to promote professional wrestling out of it. it is it the best venue? Maybe to some, maybe not to some. But you know, I, I've known guys that have gone there, and it's it's local to me. I have no issue with the dude, and I've had fun every time I've been there. They have a huge fan base too. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, my, I used to hate Twitter. Absolutely yeah. couldn't stand it. I'm a Facebook and Instagram guy. Grim's like, just watch. So I, I go on there and they tag me in the one Twitter. I mean, my phone went off all day. I, it's ridiculous how many people just begin to follow you just from that <laughs> show crazy, alone. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, I had this one. And I'm like, and I'm a single dad, right? So I had this one kid, you know, of course, you know, like they're fans. So they got to heckle you. This kid, he had to be, I saw his picture, no more than 10 years old. His yeah. Uh, handle was uh, Titty Blaster. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like sitting here, like you know, just getting my stuff done. And at the end, I'm like, dude, well, I got a kid named Titty Blaster. He's <laughs> the shit out of me right now. Yeah, we, we've had uh, experience with some of the fans from from that. So yeah, it's great. I mean, you can see on the wall. Uh, Maybe I'm a little drawing. Oh uh, uh, yeah, there yeah, you so, go. Yeah, yeah that's a pretty cool. So, man, let's talk about this, man. UWA Elite, man. Uh huh. You know, how was it? You know, you know, wrestling out there, part of Kentucky breed. Kentucky bread. Um, bread. Sorry. No, no, you're good. Uh, so I want to say that I met met the boy. I don't think, yeah, no, Justin or I'm sorry, Clay. Clay didn't do any of uh, Dapper shows, but I want to say that I saw Georgie Boy at a Dapper show before that. And I, I've always known Kyle. I've known some of the guys, and. Um, like it was on my radar, but it, like UWA was something like I never, you know. But as you know, as I kind of networked out, uh, I met a lot of the guys, and um, then working for Rob, uh, Kentucky Bread became a regular thing there. And that Haku match I was talking about before, which of course it was for a Fury show, so what was originally supposed to be just me and Georgie versus Haku turned into Kentucky Bread and Vinny Chenzo versus Haku, Louie, Magic, and uh, Brandon the Bull. So I want to say some, uh, either Dave Swan or one of the other UWA guys was there that night, and they were like, you know what, this dynamic can work. Because up until that point, Kentucky Bread was kind of more like a, just a comedy trio. So they brought me in as uh, Cousin Vinny and, you know, just to add, which I would think would be comedy, of like bringing, you know, the Italian midget, you know what I mean? Like, but, it, you know, but like, I you know, I wrestle more like a pit bull, you know, in your face. I like to be intense. So it kind of gave it more of that edge and it made it more versatile. And um, over those few years that I was there, we've had some awesome matches. One of my favorites, uh, we had, um, it was four teams. It was... Kentucky Bread split up, and then Low Life Louie and Mac, and Mercy Lago Rojo, and uh, Ryan Rumble. And uh, it was th that's the coolest thing about UWA is, you know, on top of how athletically talented those guys are, there's so many cool different gimmicks and such good, like, storytelling, like, and their editing is great. So, one, something like that, like, with such cool, contrasting personalities and you know, as people think that that's difficult, but that made the match that much easier to, you know, flow and make the crowd was just right with it. One thing I like about UWA, they have their core guys, but they're not afraid to bring in, you know, somebody else, you know, to, to change it up a little bit. Because, you know, those, sometimes those matches could be a little stale if you just have the same mix of people. Yeah. You know, and they, they, they've gone out, they got like the Spirit Squad, they brought in, you know, uh, you know, Mac and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool that... They take risk, you know, where some companies are just like, hey, this is, this is their core guys, and this is what you kind of... This is what you get, yeah, no. You, and that's that's what's really cool. So, like, you know, guys like Arcadia and Corvus, you know, obviously they're, you know, pioneers there, and uh, Jay Lethal. But what I like about UWA in the sense that they do that is they don't bring in a lot of, you know, your typical legends, you know. And I'm not knocking anybody, but, you know, like where we'll bring in a lot of ECW guys at SWF. Mm -hmm. And we'll bring in, you know, Tito and, you know, some bigger drawer names, like when we had Kali and stuff. UWA brings in different ones, unique. Like if you watch like uh, UWA Elite vs. The World, how they brought in like just a very random selection of indie superstars to take on UWA. Like whether it's Macintosh or Sozio mm -hmm. or uh, Gacy was one of them one time. Like they're smart about it. They do, you know, they have a, they do it really well. Yeah, they have, they have a pretty solid fan base as well. Yeah. Like, uh, everybody, 
you can tell it's like whenever we go, we always see like the same people that are there. They're like very loyal to them as well. Mm-hmm. And they, they put on some like good stories as well. That you, you always remember like, oh, last time when I was here last month, I remember these guys had this story building. They, they keep you going and wondering what's coming next. Oh, time. yeah. They're really good with that consistency. And that's, I, I, for me, if I was a fan, I'd appreciate that. Definitely. I'm kind of mad it took a month off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they usually do that for December. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, you got in the ring with TJ Marconi, you know, you you won the championship, now you lost it, man. How how was wrestling a guy like him and how was it winning the championship? Um but trying to think of the best way to put this. Satisfying is, is is a way to describe it, but um I mean, I, I would just say elated, happy. Like, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest things about SWF and like, I, you know, I always will revert back to that because that's home base for me. And, uh, you know, we didn't really have, you know, we, we've had awesome heavyweight champs before, but, you know, we never really had like a solid program. You know, SWF didn't have that. We had a lot of one-offs and we had maybe guys have like, you know, a series of two, but nothing that ever really lasted. So the the thing that made me so happy about the feud with TJ was it was something that started prior and it ran off of five guys heat. Mm-hmm. So when, when TJ was the original champion and then when we did the cash in and, you know, being a smaller guy like I am, um, I... I thrive. My, one of my favorite dynamics of a match is that David and Goliath thing. Um, I love that. I love being that little shithead with a Napoleon complex that I don't care how big you are. I'm going to do whatever it takes, whether I lie, cheat, steal, like Guerrero would have. And um, we incorporated a lot of elements, and we made. I think we over over that throughout that whole year up until TJ coming back and getting it back from me. Um, we gave the fans, I, I personally feel like we gave them a lot of cool moments, including five guys and a lot of stuff with me and TJ one-on-one of him, you know, finally chasing a guy that he can, you know, in real life could probably stomp out, you know? Yeah. Like really compelling storytelling to you guys. So definitely. How, how does that feel when like, you know, like, like Rob Fury puts, you know, his faith in you to make you, you know, his heavyweight champion. And basically, like, puts the company on your back. Basically, you're, fa- you're like the face of the company mm-hmm. when you know something like that happens. It's and it's it's honestly, it's not one of those things where you know you want to toot your own horn, but you know it's it's one of those things where it's you you want to give it to a person who gets it, yeah. who's definitely paid their dues, and um, you know who who wants to see the the brand succeed. And and I can say that about. Both TJ and myself is we, you know, we want to see SWF succeed, yeah. you know, like I said, given the past and given a lot of the, uh, you know, the hate that we've gotten mm-hmm. these, these past two years, we have turned this boat around a lot and yeah. we've reached a lot of people, you know, we, and one of the biggest things that stands out to me is, um, where we were trying to kind of steer clear of North Jersey a little bit. We started going to Totoa and, uh, we have this huge rambunctious crowd from Totowa now that even follows us all the way down to Ocean <laughs> County or, or to your, you know, your middle of the state shows that we're doing. Nice. Yeah. So who, who's giving you the best advice in wrestling so far? The best advice in wrestling. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I would definitely say there, there's a few people if I'm, if you guys, if I may, yeah, yeah. um, so on top of training, absolutely underneath Danny Cage. Danny Cage was our guy. Um, I can't think of a, a greater. And it's what's funny is and he didn't really have necessarily the longest indie career, but this dude just gets it, gets it top to bottom. He can explain A through Z, who, what, where, when, why, how of you know why things work and why things don't. Uh, I used to butt heads with Danny a lot, and more often than not, he was right and I was wrong. But it's one of those things where. He always looked out for his boys and he always treated us like his boys, you know? So there were, I mean, on top of just in ring things, Danny always, you know, there was a lot of life lessons that he taught us too, you know, because that's the, I believe what separates the Monster Factory from other places is that Monster Factory wants to build you for a career in professional wrestling, not for a hobby. You know, in a lot of these other schools, you know, you notice now that, you know, they wave mat fees, they don't care, they have guys just come train for the hell of it, do whatever you want, hey, and hey, good luck on shows. You know, and that's, that's cool, but that's, that's like a, a big problem with Jersey right now is the oversaturation of people doing that. 
is that, you know, we're in the eighties, you know, that, that didn't work. You know, you earned your spot. You didn't just, Oh, Hey, I can come here and play wrestler. But, um, yeah, Danny, uh, Bilvis Wesley, uh, while Bill Wiles was, uh, another trainer who I had a lot of hands on experience with and, um, helped me out a lot. But uh, a key guy, and he wasn't a uh, necessary. I mean, he would be a guest, you know, instructor at the factory. But I, I worked with him a lot through there and through FWF. Was uh, Pitbull Gary Wolf, mm-hmm. um, idol of mine. Um, me, me and Jeff Noyes when we did Riot, you know, we tag team wrestling has been my thing for a long time. So like singles is still kind of weird to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love doing it, but uh, like I just I, I tag team wrestling is what captivates me one hundred ten percent. And um, the Pipples of ECW were just like, you know, they were just this, like, so exciting. Like, bell to bell. Yeah. Everything they did. And um, I wrestled Gary, I can't tell you how many times, on a team, singles, against each other, six mans. And uh, it always just got better. And, like, Gary always, like, before anybody else, not to sound selfish, but he, he took a liking to me. He would take me to the side and, you know, this is what we can do better. This is where we totally killed it with, you know. Nice. And you took, you kind of, you took on part of that name, right? And for a while you were called the... I was punk the punk rock, rock pit bull, right? Yeah, yeah. That's dope. So, um, kind of like switching gears a little bit. Uh, I see you have like a lot of cool tattoos going on. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I got and a lot of random ones. One that like sticks out to me is, I believe that's Crumb. From Crumb, like, yep. Monsters. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you, yeah. you kind of like tell us like the meaning of some of the, the your tattoos? Oh, like absolutely. Um, I, I, we'll start with the arms. I got, I got so many. Uh, this is Thrice. That's uh, one of my favorite bands. Um, they got me through a lot of hard times. Yeah. Like I said, I I have no problem. Um, you know, I'm an open book. Uh, in between those years when I first started wrestling, you know, under that who's I'm not going to mention their name, but before I, I went out to Oklahoma and I uh, I had a bad pill problem. Yeah. So when I was graduating high school after my uh, grandpa died, um, I just, I, I didn't know what to do with myself and I just got really bad into pills and I went out to Oklahoma to clean up and Thrice is one of the bands, man. Just like I, I'm as much as I'm into wrestling, I'm into music. I'm yeah. a music slut. Uh, and Thrice has just such positive, reflective, just very real music. I mean, lyrics to instrument that, uh, speaks to me. That's uh, My Pet Monster. I don't know. Yeah. like So where most kids probably just had a teddy bear, I had a My Pet Monster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, Crumb, because uh, just why the hell not? Because yeah, right. <laughs> I just got a kick out of that show. Um, I am a man of faith. Um, so uh, I come from a Christian background, and I, you know, I do believe in God. God helped me a lot with you know, my recovery process and stuff right. like that. This one here is My Family Crest. And uh, when you walk on the inside of like a castle, and I think of like you know a crest that hangs up in a castle, you know you do the marble floor. Yeah. Um, this guy here, I actually drew myself. Oh, nice. uh, yeah, I'm a little bit of an archie. Uh, I, you know, it's not everyone goes, oh, you're Illuminati. I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm like, dude, no, man. I'm like, the way it works is, I believe, I believe you're your own all-seeing. Yeah. You're your own truth. You know, and some days you have your bad stormy days, and then some days you have your good shiny days, and uh, you know, music is what gets me in between them. Pretty sick, it's nice. And the last one you guys should probably see. This is from my pops. Um, you guys ever see that show called Turtle Man? Turtle Man? No, crazy hillbilly dude. He and like no teeth. He's got a crazy bull haircut, <laughs> and he just goes out in swamps and marshes and pulls out uh, snapping turtles. Oh yeah. And he goes live action and does this. Well, my dad is not a man of emotion. He's he's a muscle bound meatball. He's a pro bodybuilder, and uh, I he doesn't laugh, doesn't cry. He puts this show on and he starts cracking the fuck up. Oh my <laughs> so, so all me and my siblings, we all got live action tattoos from my dad. Oh, pretty sick. Pretty yeah. Is it safe to say you're a One Direction fan? Oh God, no. no? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a One Direction guy. What kind of music do you listen to? Yeah. Me, um. Yeah, like I said, man, I go from anything to everything. Um, a lot of jam bands and a lot of new age stuff. Like I like mute math, and then in the same breath, I can go and I can I can put on fifty. I can put on G Unit. Oh, nice! <laughs> I can swing back the old school Outkast, Southern playlist to Cadillac music, and then in the next twenty minutes, I can go to Alan Jackson and Country Swoon, dude. Nice. I uh, I'll give anything a chance, you know. I mean, there's there's some stuff I just I can't you know tolerate, but. I'm willing to give anything a chance because much like wrestling, you know, there's genres, mm-hmm. and if you can't appreciate one genre, you shouldn't, you know. 
And um, you guys uh, at SWF, you guys have been doing um, the filming with uh, the Underdogs crew. Mm-hmm. Um, can you kind of just tell us, like, how's that experience? And, you know, like, what do you believe, like, the purpose of Underdogs is? Like, what are you guys trying to accomplish? <laughs> so... It was a little, you know, different from the get-go. You know, a lot of us that have been around were a little, you know, skeptical because that, uh, what's the name of the old one that Dapper did that, uh, it was not a card subject that changed. It was a card subject that changed. Yeah, change. Change. yeah. yeah you know. Yeah. And, you know, but in the same breath, a lot of times, you know, like, you look at that and I'm like, I don't want people to think of a, of this and have it be a damper on indie wrestling yeah. of like, you know, you see Dapper, well, where's Danny, you know, and, and making us look unorganized. Mm-hmm. So when we were approached, the whole idea was, you know, is because really that's what SWF is, man. We've, we've faced a lot of hate, but we, you know, we still keep boxing and we still keep putting on shows was that we're underdogs and we're doing, we're trying to do what it takes to, to be on that Jersey all pro level, to be on that CZW level, to be on that tier one, to be on, you know, the competitive, all these other brands, not saying that we don't feel that we are, but you know, we, we're not getting that exposure yet and hopefully underdogs, you know, when, when people see that, you know, see that we do have a lot of talented guys that people don't know about yet. And we're trying to get to that next level. Yeah, that was a crazy documentary. I forgot all about that. And then, uh, I, I, I grew up, you know, Jersey all pro watching guys like, uh, trying acid and stuff like that too. Oh yeah. God rest his soul. Yeah. man. He's one of my favorites. Yeah. You know, career cut way too short. And, uh, I remember watching that, you know that documentary is awesome. That was a good yeah. documentary. And, um, so, you know, growing up, so what were some of your favorite moments? You know, at Jersey All Pro, at some of these indie shows that you attended. Oh, um, CZW, best of the best one. Was I mean, just ridiculous. Jay and Mark, like home run, yeah. home run. Seeing a guy like Winger, you know, that was really cool. Um, Ruckus was always, I mean, I, I just feel like he's one of those guys who probably sat in the back and he was like, tell me I won't. And he'd go out there and do something that just blow people's minds. Uh, best of the best one was a great one. Um, any anniversary show for JAP. I mean, all their shows were good, but you, I just, you know, you knew when the anniversary show was coming up, JAP was going to put out something ridiculous. Yeah, those are some good times. <laughs> yeah. And another, I mean... Another one of those matches that stuck out to me. I know it's probably a little bit later than those JAP days, um, but um, one uh, homicide in Carino. Yeah. Was, the homicide Carino series was another thing that just like you know I felt like I was stagnant at, at some point, and that just like revitalized my you know like. They got some crazy ass matches, and like my first show was Haas and Jay Lethal. Mm-hmm. You know, like how how incredible is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, you talked about the changes in SWF. I mean, how, you know, you know, talking about from the from Mega Slam until now, it's almost been a year. Um, what what have you seen in the locker room that has kind of kind of kicked the door to go full throttle? You know, with the management or with the wrestlers that you know, is it a team effort? Is it you know, what do you see that's really? Oh, I would say one hundred and ten percent a team effort. Um, I'll start with new faces. Mm-hmm. I would absolutely say now we now we're seeing guys like Evander James here. Yeah. We're seeing guys like Sebastian Cage, mm-hmm. seeing the King of New York with Miguel, um, Steve Lugo. Uh, you know, it's you, people refer to it as New Yorker, but I mean, it's it's not even like that. Those guys are fan like SWF. We really backstage have become a family, mm-hmm. and. Um, those guys have, you know, set the bar for some of our younger guys, you know, to step up their game. If you look at your Ace Marksmans and your Whalen Cages, even, you know, these guys who are only a few years in, you know, being, you know, it's it's that healthy competition breeds, you know, energy out of you and, and to up their game. And then a lot of it's, you know, dudes just evolving. I mean, if you if you start, like you said, at Mega Slam at the beginning of the year, Look how far Jordan Oliver Jr. and Kid Christian have come. Yeah. Um, one of my one of my absolute favorites and standouts this year was uh, Jordan and Shane Strickland. I yeah. believe it was, it was. I think it was our February show in Bayville. Yeah. And uh, no love lost. And um, 
I've had faith in Jordan since day one. I, I still remember Christian. I believe we were in Spotswood for his first match before he was the Sugar Rush kid or any of that. And uh, it just amazes me. Like those those two guys. I, I just hope they you know stay free of injury. But um, you know they've developed a fan base, and you know it's like anything. You know it's drawing people from other places to see what we're doing. Yeah. Now when we, when we talked to uh, Rob uh, like last week or a couple weeks ago. Um, he told us uh, he was going to add more shows like upcoming. So, uh, <clears throat> like, how do you feel about like that? Him adding more shows and like him basically, he's like, he's having like a lot of faith in you guys, and he's also putting faith into himself because he's like he knows like we can do this and we're adding more shows, and he's hoping to like you know just accomplish a lot this upcoming year. Oh yeah, it's an abs- It's absolutely a uh, it's a total positive feeling, you know, when when he does that and, and you have faith, you know, and. He, in the same breath, not you know, not just to sound prideful, but like show me another indie right now. You know that's that I think it's thirty something shows we did, thirty plus maybe thirty plus shows. All I don't remember the exact number offhand, but I I don't know a lot of other indies in New Jersey that did that this year, and uh, put out quality. You know, I mean, not every show is gonna you know draw a thousand people, but you know we've given people a lot of quality throughout all the shows that we've done. Um. And it's excitement too, you know. It's it's more opportunities, and you know, getting outside of just the SWF box, you know, I always want to see pro wrestling succeed. I want to, you know, especially in a day and age where boxing's kind of starting to make its comeback now, and MMA kind of, you know, has the rain on things. Like, I want pro wrestling still to be that top tier thing yeah. that people look to and know that it's going to be universal. Yeah. So more opportunities present that. So you had a champion first champion match. Uh, how was that getting in there with you know Joe Gacy? Oh, uh, thrilling! Um, <laughs> absolutely, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, dude, yeah, awesome <laughs> guys like him. That's and, awesome, yeah. too. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. Uh, I hope so. I, I never want to disappoint anybody, man. I'm you know I'm more of an antique, if you will, in the wrestling age. You now I'm gonna be 33 tomorrow. Oh, nice. But uh, guys like him and guys like Kyle the Beast, those are dudes that you just watch, and you know not just sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but guys that just get it and guys that, you know, they're going to do something new and they're going to do something that you've seen before. And it's going to be that much more impressive now that you've seen it again. Um, and I don't want to say that I, I always believe that you should have nerves. If you don't have nerves before you go out there, you're, you're, you, you shouldn't be going out there. But, um, in the same breath, when I went out there with Gacy, my nerves weren't as bad. Which is is good because it, it, I just felt like it was natural. It was chemistry. We still spoke to the five guys thing that was going on, mm-hmm. and uh, I believe it was a competitive match. I believe the fans got their money's worth, and then it led to a cool thing at the tail end of the show where you know CZW was taking on SWF, kind of. Yeah. You know, That's I awesome. mean, I fell victim to everybody, but. <laughs> <laughs> So you're the bad guys. Yeah, it's, to, it's, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that crowd, that crowd went home happy that night. Yeah. Kind, of, kind of like something you kind of like touched on a little bit prior. Uh, how, like, how do you feel about like the uh, like the mixture of like you know MMA going into boxing, MMA going into wrestling, wrestlers going into MMA, and we even saw like Floyd Mayweather at WrestleMania like a couple of years ago. Like everyone yeah. like just mixing up and like you know even, the action sports. Even Jack Swagger now, Bellator. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I, I hope him the best for that. I guess for me personally, I mean, I'm an MMA fan, but I'm def. I don't keep up with it as much as I used to. The, the days, the last, I would say, the last days where I really was enjoying it was when. Uh, Matt Hughes and Sarah were around, yeah. and um, Royce Gracie. Yeah, Royce Gracie had just finished that one. Mm-hmm. Remember the one he? I think Hughes had him in the armbar for like a minute and a yeah, half, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, dude, just let it come, come <laughs> on. And uh, Forrest Griffin. But I think it's it's circumstantial to the person. Like obviously, a guy like Brock Lesnar, it's gangbusters on yeah. a full stream level like that. It's generating money for both. One hand washes the other. Awesome, draws people to wrestling, draws people to MMA. Yeah. On our level, on the indie level, um, I guess it depends because a dude like Matt Riddle, who now is over everywhere he goes, known all over the world, has an amazing career. And it's cool, too, for me because, you know, he's, he got his start at the factory. And a lot of people, when he, you know, that initial, oh, he's just the dude that got kicked from uh, Ultimate Fighter for smoking pot. Yeah. That's well, you know, that's great. Yeah. But 
to see the, the short distance and where he's gone in a short time. Mm-hmm. Awesome. But in the same breath now, I feel like there's a lot of dudes that are trying to mirror that and mimic that. And that's, you know, I, it's like any gimmick. You know, don't take away from somebody that is, you know, paving away. Add your taste to it. You know, I, I think you can still bring MMA on an indie level, but it doesn't always have to be, you know, the same look, the same get up. Yeah. You know, again, and like Speedball Mike Bailey is another one. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he he's more of an MMA thing, but, you know, he stuck to karate. He stuck to, like, you know... It, yeah. His mo. I loved it when Ken Shamrock came and stuff like that. You know. Oh yeah, in the he, way like, back days. Was, yeah, like he legitimized, you know, the, the intercontinental championship. Like you know, like this is something prideful. Not that it wasn't legitimate before that, but you know, you had, you know, it was there's a different type of legitimate that he brought to it. You know, like it's a real fight almost kind of thing. You know, when he yeah. beat, like when he beat up the Rock and stuff like that, you felt like this could be. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. The Rock might not walk out now because he's just kind yeah. of real, real, real. Yeah, yeah, I share that sentiment. Like, if you pull that even further, it's like you know, because back in those late '80s, early '90s days, there was still that population. I feel of like, oh, I could kick this guy's ass, you know, if I yeah. saw him at a bar. But like you said, though, like, so a dude like Ken Shamrock, a guy who's been fighting bare knuckles, like, is fighting The Rock. Like, oh, maybe I can't kick this dude's ass, yeah. you know? Just seeing him toss people around is incredible. Ken, Ken Shamrock talking about that. <laughs> oh yeah. So, man, you know, from another legend, you know, you got in the ring with Tommy Dreamer. Mm-hmm. You know, when they throw these guys, you know, like EC, ECW legends or some of these marquee names in front of you, you know, is that like a challenge to, you know, some, maybe sometimes to pull out a good match of maybe somebody who hasn't wrestled in a while or, you know, or do you feel like the company just knows that you're going to be, you know, you're going to entertain them with this matchup or something like that, you know? I think it speaks like you know a, a lot to my character. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people appreciate me as a heel. So you know, a, a lot of the dynamic when I have worked names over the you know is has been you know Vinny's going in as a heel, and a lot of times, especially with a guy like Dreamer, it, it, it just feels natural. You know, like you know, I I you know I, I've always felt it took me a little bit of while. You know, I would say a few years in after the factory to really find my niche, but um. When I go out there with guys like that now, and, and especially if I'm heel, like I, I know that I can do it as a face too. But like th- that match we had with him, and it was me and Bravo versus him Marconi. I mean, it was just it was gangbusters. Like I mean, it was just an easy night, you know. Not that we weren't going out there and taking it easy, but like you know, he he's been around here for so long, and he's filled with so much wisdom that you know you don't have to go out there and break your neck. There's things that we're gonna do that you know we, this crowd it's gonna be easy. Nice. Now, can you can you tell us like what do you what is your like ultimate goal like what, what do you want to accomplish with wrestling? Um, I'm a realist, uh, you know, I, and and personally, you know, being a single dad, like my dream isn't to be riding around WWE, watching the world go by me as I sit in a tour bus or a van riding town to town. That's not my goal. I mean, if if it was ever my dream job, I would love to do commentary with them. Yeah. Like you know, commentary is always the thing that's been in the back of my mind. I think I could do well with that, you know, with the proper training. But um, personally, man, indie wrestling has always been my heart. Um, you know, going back, like I said, going back to the CZW and JAP days, just being captivated enough to finally push myself to to pursue this later than most. And uh, I just want to, you know, whether it's with Rob or maybe down the line if I have my own, you know, school open up, I just want to help produce kids and get these kids out there. And I want to see wrestling get better and better and better. You know, like I, you know, I, I spoke on Jordan and uh, Christian before. And, you know, now we have uh, kids like Ellis Taylor and Jay the Key Evans. Um, Jordan and Ellis wrestled the other night on uh, Saturday and tore the house down. Second match on, you know, and that's another one of those things. Healthy competition and everybody else that, you know, has to follow that and, you know, step their game up. Yeah, he's really catching on quick. Yeah. Jordan? Yeah. Colin West was here and he, you know, we were talking about him being like beat down, but I also see a little bit of Owen Hart in him too. Yeah, you know, I could see that. expressions, you know, just being a, a nasty heel, you know. You know I, I remember growing up hating Owen, mm-hmm. you know, when he ripped the glasses and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit for those guys too. You know? Yeah. So, um, you know, in closing, man, you know, what, what are your goals now in SWF, you know, uh, for the future? Is it to keep the 
the hardcore championship and maybe capture the world title again and be dual champion? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's an honor that, you know, Rob, you know, they've had enough faith in me. You know, I am the first triple crown winner, you know, for SWF. Um, I've never really gone down. I mean, I've done stuff in back here. Not that that counts, but, you know, I, you know, I'm not a stranger to it, but at this level, like, you know, it's fun doing hardcore. Like I, I, I want, I'm ready to see where this goes. Um, full level. Absolutely. I would love to be back in the chase, you know, for, for the world heavyweight title or maybe a five guys reunion. Uh, <laughs> you, you never know. <laughs> um, I personally, I just want to have fun and I want to see the brand grow. Now it's my last question. Uh, when it's all said and done, what does Vinny Chinzo want to be remembered for? Scaling back to um, that Brett and Slaughter thing, I just remember the way that I felt yeah. as an eight year old, yeah. um, and what that did for me. You know, like you know, some folks. I mean, I, I played sports and stuff. You know, but we all have that one thing we gravitate towards that's larger than life to you. That no matter what, I think you know, you know, you see these in memes and you see it, but you know, at the end of the day, you just it's a, something that just speaks to you, and you can put that on and everything else kind of tunes out. And wrestling is that love for me. So I want to be that person that delivers that same feeling that I felt that Brett and Slaughter gave me that night. For what, whether you're eight or whether you're the dude who's in the middle of his work week who just needs to go get his frustrations out and go watch pro wrestling, I just want to make sure I'm captivating people's interests and making sure that they feel that their money is well spent. And where can people find you on social media if they want to connect with you? In the desert. <laughs> in the desert. <laughs> um, uh, let me just, yeah, um, you can find me on Instagram. I believe it is oddsoul underscore Vinicenzo. Mm -hmm. I should know these offhand. <laughs> I've noticed a lot of people have changed it to match like everything. Yeah, that's it's, you got to make it universal. Yeah, so on on Instagram it's odd soul underscore Vinicenzo. on Twitter it's just odd soul Chenzo. and on Facebook it's uh, just Vinicenzo. Awesome. Well, we definitely we thank you for coming through. Nah, man, thank you guys. I had a blast. Yeah, thank man, you. We definitely appreciate you coming on. Uh, for us, we're Wrestling IQ One Hundred and One. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Wrestling IQ 101. Check out our videos, youtube.com backslash Wrestling IQ 101. Subscribe. Make right. sure you subscribe, like, share. Uh, definitely check us out on B Plus Player Radio Network. Uh, you can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play, all that good stuff. Make sure you subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Yeah, definitely. And we are <laughs> out. You have just listened to the Wrestling IQ 101 podcast, powered by B Plus Player Radio.